Um, yeah, I, I, yeah, well, I just brought it up. I don't know if we can close that door if the light's good for folks. Check, check. I think this is the this is the mic. With you. Okay. You can leave it on the table. I think it'll pick up fine. Okay. Uh, and so yeah, we're gonna do twenty and. Um, yeah. So yeah, if you mute that. I think we're in good shape, and I'll let you just introduce yourself and and your topic, and and I'll. Uh, um, I'm on. Virginia Palacios. I'm the state and local policy manager with SPEAR. SPEAR stands for South Central Partnership for Energy Efficiency as a Resource. We're one of six regional energy efficiency organizations in the United States that are recognized by the U.S. Department of Energy, and our region covers Texas and Oklahoma. So there are other groups just like us all across the U.S. Um, that essentially are um, promoting energy efficiency, trying to make sure all the different stakeholders are connected and that more investment is coming into energy efficiency. Um, we are a 501c3, so we don't actually do too much advocacy, um, so we're limited in that capacity, um, just to let you know. But uh, yeah, so what I wanna do today is help us all kind of like learn a little bit, have a common vocabulary that we can work with moving forward about energy and energy efficiency. Um, and hopefully we'll identify some opportunities along the way. I'm gonna show you some information about the CPS Energy STEP program. Um, and uh, I think we'll, we'll figure some things out together. And at the end, I wanna have a, a talk, a discussion about values, needs, wants, um, in particular about um, the equity piece that we all kind of keep talking about needing to get to, but uh, I was hoping we could kind of dig in a little bit today. Uh, and I have some data for you to look at as well. Uh, so, let's see. This is getting kind of wonky. Just wait for that to come back. Um, let's see. All right, well, I just wanted to show you, the next slide that I have is kind of like a diagram of the electric generation and distribution system, um, just so that we can all be on the same page about how this stuff works. Um, so over there on the left, you see you know, power plants generating uh, power, and then that kind of goes through these long range transmission lines, goes through some stuff down substations, and then comes to the distribution lines that bring power to your homes. Um, and so the scope of energy efficiency that SPEAR works on is specifically energy efficiency in buildings. Um, and we are working on residential, commercial, and industrial spaces. So, um, so it's pretty much all buildings. Um, there are some organizations that do work on energy efficiency as it relates to power plants. We're not really talking about that here. We're just kind of talking about the built environment. And then if we could talk about the from different stakeholder perspectives. How about the first question, um, what kind of energy efficiency measures are y'all familiar with? Yeah. 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 yeah, like an air conditioning system, you know, insulation. If you want to just like spit it, spit it out, go for it. I live in a drafty bungalow and I sort of opposed to non-draftiness. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Okay. So okay. like, I'm a, I'm You're in opposed favor to of draftiness. Oh, okay. You like draftiness. It okay. saved my mother's life a few times when we were gas leaks. Oh, interesting. Yeah. yeah, that's something that's come up, um, and it's definitely an issue in energy efficiency because uh, sometimes if you seal a home too tight, that <coughs> keeps indoor air pollutants inside, um, and that that can be an issue for especially for people who live close to power plants where they have. They have uh, some of that air coming inside, and then they, they just keep breathing it in, um, especially if they don't have the right kind of ventilation going on in their home. So, that's about that. I'd be in favor of insulating one or two rooms, but not the whole house. Ceiling, yeah, ceiling one or two rooms. <coughs> yeah. Well, yeah, when we talk about building insulation, we're mostly talking about what goes between the walls to kind of keep the, the heat in or out. Um, 
any other energy and what do you mean by that specifically designing gaming so that they cool themselves or keep themselves up rather than having a forced air system or something like that so having like higher ceilings better insulation and things like that okay so lots of different measures out there. And we'll go through a list of some of the things that CPS Energy um, provides rebates and incentives for later. Um, and so why would any of us as customers want to do energy efficiency? Cost. Cost. Saves us money, right? Uh, any other reasons? Comfort. Comfort, yeah. For some people, a more comfortable home if you do it right. <laughs> unless unless it takes away the draftiness that you enjoy. <laughs> um, Okay, uh, and how about for an electricity provider or utility, why would they want to do energy efficiency? Why would they want to provide rebate, rebates or incentives? Because it's cheaper to have their uh, used customers uh, have greater energy efficiency than for them to build a whole new power plant. Yeah, they get to avoid uh, generation costs, also transmission and distribution mm -hmm. costs, you know, making some of those lines that, that bring us energy uh, and that reduces overall rates. Um, any other reasons y'all want to throw out there? I would also throw in just customer satisfaction. Some utilities do it because their customers ask for it and it's kind of like a feel-good thing that they like to do. Um, and uh, you know, it can also help to lower bills for low-income customers who've had a hard time paying their bills at all. And so if you can actually bring their rates down to where they're affordable, then you know, it's more sustainable for the business. Um, Local and state elected officials, any ideas there? <laughs> if they're interested in attaining the air quality standards, that yeah. might be a reason. So it's been really interesting, and we've been looking at this issue. Uh, the, the Federal Clean Air Act allows for, um, for energy efficiency to be included in state plans for complying with ozone standards. Um, However, not many states have been successful in actually including it as an enforceable mechanism. And so it's something that we've been taking a look at and trying to figure out if we, if we could include it. Um, so there is like some impetus for state officials to look at it, or, or agencies, I should say. Um, and then at the local level, any, any ideas? To meet a carbon plan. To meet a cargo plan, <laughs> that's a good idea. Um, you know, there's also a jobs argument to be made for energy efficiency. There's a whole industry of service providers out there that are making energy efficiency happen, and, uh, and there's a lot of money to be had there, uh, money and jobs. And so local elected officials should care, also care about it for that reason. Um, okay, so some key concepts. Oh wait, first, um, all right, pick any liquid other than water. Favorite liquid. Orange juice. Orange juice, okay, <laughs> all right. So I wanted to do that so that in the next analogy we didn't get confused with water systems. <laughs> so let's pretend that you have a faucet in your home and orange juice comes out of it. <laughs> all right, so uh, there's a difference between the term energy and the term demand, and I've heard folks try to use these terms interchangeably, but they're different, so I just want to distinguish them right now. So, um, so right here, uh, you know, you can think of demand as uh, kind of like an instantaneous amount that would, uh, that would come out of the faucet at any given point in time. So if you have a, a one gallon per minute orange juice faucet or a five gallon per minute orange juice faucet, that would be your demand. But um, after five minutes, you would get five gallons of orange juice in the, in the one gallon per minute faucet. So, so they would be the, the same in the end in terms of consumption. And so that overall consumption is kind of like the same thing as energy. So it's the amount of, of power used over time. And demand is just this instantaneous amount. And so a lot of the way that you, you hear about this talked about um, is uh, in terms of utilities is uh, peak demand. And so we're not necessarily always interested in uh, any given point of time, like how much demand is, is being asked for on the system. But, uh, but we care about the most demand that we're ever gonna be asked for on the system. So end of the day, I get off work, it's 5 p.m., I go home, I turn all my lights on, I crank the AC way down, 
I start cooking dinner, I'm using a lot more energy at home. And that's when everybody else in the community is getting home and they're all using a lot more energy. And so um, generally like these hours when everybody's at home using lots of energy, we see peak demand on the system. And so that's when utilities are, are kind of like needing to make sure that they can provide the most energy um, at that given point in time. And that's how they make decisions about whether or not to go and, uh, and create more power plants so that they can provide more generation for the community. Um, and so the other thing that I wanted to talk about here is how the greenhouse gas emissions differ when we're thinking about energy versus demand. And so <laughs> the reason why this would, this would matter is because um, any given point in time throughout the day, the amount of power that I'm generating is producing a discrete amount of emissions, right? It's carbon dioxide coming from a coal-fired power plant. There might be some methane leakage coming from the natural gas system. Um, and hopefully no emissions coming from wind or solar. Um, and so uh, if, if you take the entire amount of time in a day and all of the demand that has been asked for throughout the day, you can get your total emissions, right? But a lot of the utility programs that you see will reduce, will reduce energy in kilowatt hours, but um, they're also designed specifically to reduce peak demand. Oh, is it Not this, it's the mouse. Uh, um, or the your, can you move your mouse on your computer? Yeah, sure. All right. Um, all right, I feel like I'm losing y'all, so I'm going to go to the next slide, and I think this will be a little clearer. Um, all right, so here's the typical electric curve. So this is on the horizontal, the x-axis, we're looking at time of day, and then on the y-axis, we're looking at electricity use. And so that would be megawatts. That's your demand. So what I was trying to explain earlier is that uh, at the time of day when everybody is using energy, you're hitting your peak load and your utility needs to make sure that they're generating enough power, that they have the ability to generate enough power to hit that peak load. But the way they get there is throughout the day when they're not at peak, they're pretty much always going to have a base amount of generation being produced on the system. And then as they start needing to add on more, they might go to different types of energy sources to, to get you to that peak. <coughs> and Kaiva and I were talking about this earlier. She might have a little bit more insight to, to add into how CPS energy gets there. But typically what I've heard is that to get that last um, incremental amount of, of marginal energy that you need, you're going to be bringing on the most expensive kind of power. So it's a, you're going to be trying to use your cheapest power down when you're way down here most of the time. But that last like smaller portion of the day, the only thing that's left is the most expensive. And that tends to be the dirtiest in terms of emissions. And so uh, Kaiba, do you know, do you have a sense of how CPS energy controls for peak? Well, we do know that they're now cycling their uh, coal plants to meet peak. Of course, they're also using their natural gas plants in that way. But that change in, in how they use their coal plants, I think, is significant because it used to be that the coal plants were filling that base load mm -hmm. capacity. And what we just heard in our meeting last week was that the ignite, you know, spruce it because they're running at about 25 percent of capacity. So a little cleaner in the base now, and so they're still pe peaking with some dirtier energy. Right, and that's yeah. because there's a lot of wind production from West Texas at night, so okay. no need to burn fuel when you have wind. Okay, and so one of the points I was trying to get to earlier is that reducing demand is good when it comes to greenhouse gas emissions because you can reduce the amount of kind of like that dirtier peaking energy that, that a utility is using. But overall, when it comes to reducing greenhouse gas emissions, focusing on energy, kilowatt hours, megawatt hours, um, is really important. And so, um, yeah, just some main points there. Uh, another key concept when it comes to energy efficiency, uh, there are organizations that will go out there and do potential studies. 
So, and there are different layers of energy efficiency potential that they think about. So they, they'll take all the different technologies that are available to create better energy efficiency, um, and I'll call that technical potential. But some of those technologies are expensive to use or they're not readily available on the market. And so what's, what's actually available is a much smaller amount. And so that would be your economics. So it's like anything that's both technically achievable and cost effective. Um, and then within that, um, just thinking about what's actually achievable in terms of market preferences. You know, some people don't like CFL light bulbs, for example. Um, some people um, don't like the way the light looks. Um, you know, they're, they're just different preferences that, that people have in the market. And then within that, um, what's actually achievable by a program like CPS Energy Step Program. Um, okay. So now we can dive into some of the policies and programs that exist. Um, real quick, just wanted to kind of show you this matrix of different, different sectors that um, energy efficiency programs and policies can impact. So there's residential, commercial, and industrial that I mentioned earlier. Within residential, there's single family and multifamily. And then uh, there are also some state laws that uh, provide funding and financing mechanisms for state agencies and state-funded higher education. I think you'll also see some municipalities, and, and I think San Antonio has some goals around uh, energy efficiency for city government buildings. Um, and so I included some of the policies that exist at the state and local level and some of the different programs that exist in the state and local level in these different categories. Uh, and you'll note, uh, there aren't really any programs that exist for industrial. I think CPS Energy does have one program that uh, caters to industrial, but there's definitely a gap there that could be filled. Um, and so I mentioned those sectors. There's also a difference between retrofitting existing buildings and uh, changing codes for new construction. Uh, typically, it's, it's easier to get energy efficiency in new construction, but it's a much smaller piece of the pie than existing buildings. And so some studies have said that in developed economies, at least half of the buildings that will be in use by 2050 have already been built. And so, uh, so definitely a need to look at existing building. Um, let's see, if anybody has a QR reader, <coughs> you can check that out or go to this site. Um, it's just the, the CPS Energy FY17 annual report for the STEP program. <laughs> and uh, it, it'll just be helpful if uh, you can kind of like follow along there. You don't have to, um, but it provides some additional descriptions that I'm not going to give you in the slides here. So I'm sorry, STEP, that's the CPS Energy Step. Yeah, and so STEP stands for uh, save, uh, save for Tomorrow Energy. Wait, <laughs> now I'm like getting it wrong, of course. Um, save Tomorrow Energy Plan. It's like... Yeah, save, save for Tomorrow Energy Plan. Yeah. Yep, that's it. it doesn't exactly roll off the tongue. <laughs> no. um, and so this is a list of the different programs they offer. Um, so they're divided into different sectors. You see residential, commercial, and those are energy efficiency specifically. And then demand response, so that is going to get at your demand savings, your megawatts, as opposed to megawatt hours on the other side. Um, and then the solar incentives as well. <laughs> and if you want to look at the program descriptions for each of these different programs, um, the page numbers are listed right there. Um, so we see the Home Efficiency Program will do a variety of different measures. Residential HVAC is air conditioning. There's a New Homes Program within these rebates, but most of these, most of these rebates and incentives will, will be focused on existing buildings as opposed to new. Um, there, this school to home program um, is a little different than the others. It's an educational program for sixth graders. Uh, so some of these are gonna are gonna kind of be more behavioral and qualitative than they are like discreetly reducing energy consumption. Uh, the schools and institutions program and the whole building optimization program are new. Uh, I'm gonna show you some carbon emission reduction data and some megawatt hour reduction data in a minute, but. There's no data for these two programs because, because they're brand new. Um, okay, so uh, CO2 reductions is what we're looking at here. 
I didn't include solar in this. So this is just the residential, commercial, and demand response programs. Um, <clears throat> but you can see out of the top 10 programs, uh, the top 10 programs out of 23 get you 97% of the CO2 reductions uh, for those sectors. So um, the biggest is commercial large lighting, then residential weatherization, residential HVAC, commercial HVAC. You can kind of go down the line on that. Commercial large lighting. So it's retrofitting lighting in commercial buildings. So any kind of like business, any bu a building like this would be considered a commercial building. So kind of like going in, if they're using like a, a, a C, I think they're called like C12 fluorescent light bulbs, they might retrofit it to a C5 or something, and, you know, or put in LEDs now. Yeah. And so public lighting is that included in this breakdown? Public lighting. Um, oh, like street lights? I don't think it is. Um, and I'm not sure what CPS Energy does with street lights, but I can find out. I know we, we used to work on street lights a little while back. Um, different cities handle it different ways. Some municipalities um, pay for the street lights themselves. Some investor owned utilities will actually own street lights in cities and manage them themselves. And uh, in a lot of cases, I've heard they're not metered. And so they don't know how much uh, is, is actually being used on the street lights. So it's kind of it's kind of a funny situation. But yeah, I don't think these incentive programs are like that. And to, to be clear about the CO2 reductions, this is only the CO2 reductions that are achieved from the STEP program. So it's not, this is not about citywide emissions or anything like that. Um, and so for energy reduction, uh, kilowatt hours, these are the top 10 programs, and I did include solar in this because I thought it would be interesting to compare. Um, the commercial large lighting uh, reduces more energy than the solar initiative for residential. <coughs> and demand response is in the orange down here. Sorry, uh, let me take a step back. So solar is in gray, green is commercial, uh, yellow is residential, and demand response is orange. So demand response only shows up once in the top 10. You can kind of see more from residential and commercial in this top 10. And that gets us to 93% of the kilowatt hour reductions in the programs. And are these net energy savings over 2010, 2017 live? It, it's just 2017. Okay. Yeah. Um, and so just to give you a sense of cost, the energy efficiency programs were 55 mil, um, and the total was about 111 million. Demand response is a lot cheaper. Um, that's why utilities like this, to do this it. This is paid for out of CPS budget from the city? How is this the bond program? Uh, yeah, where the 55 million? You know, I was trying to dig into some of that info, and it wasn't readily apparent to me how the whole system works. Um, and I couldn't find a lot on the city website. So I, I, if you all have more intelligence on that, then feel free to share. <laughs> okay. Um, where the money comes from that adds up to that 11 million for 111. I thought it was the um, I do want to take a step back. There was one thing I forgot to note about demand response. Um, do you got, uh, who knows what demand response is? Do, would you like to share with you? Uh, <laughs> well, it, it, my understanding is that it has to do with um, the periods, as you said, like the parts of the time of day when the, the larger demand on the whole uh, system is, is ramping up. And the idea is that through the uh, electronic monitoring of, of uh, your own uh, house relative to the uh, the uh, citywide or system-wide thing, then uh, your thermostat could get uh, what do you call it turned down or turned uh, yeah so adjusted it, automatically to reduce the load that you add to the whole thing and, and those sorts of so changes in consumption that began with the consumer. Yeah, and so it's directed at, at these times of day where you're experiencing peak load. Um, and so there's residential programs and there's commercial programs. And uh, some of the commercial programs, the way they work is the utility can literally call up a commercial customer and say, hey, will you turn off your, your power source for now? And, uh, and 
you know, reduce your, your usage. Um, and then for residential customers, I know there's some programs where you can let them have control of your thermostat and then they, they'll adjust the, the energy use at that point in time. Um, but one of the ways that the commercial demand response programs works is when, when a business agrees to use less power from the grid, they'll often switch to a generator. And so if they're generating that, that power from a different source using diesel, for example, there are still emissions associated with that. And so that's a consideration that we will want to bring up during the, this whole climate action and adaptation planning process. So I just wanted to flag that for the group. Um, and I'm not sure to what extent those emission reductions are sort of, or emission sources are incorporated into the analysis that's provided in the annual report. Um, and so just some summaries from the STEP program. Uh, the cost of saved energy is about five cents per kilowatt hour. Um, the reduction in revenue requirements for the utility was about $94 million in 2017. And the benefit to cost ratio was 1.86 on average for all of the, the different programs. But not. I just wanted to note, not every program has a benefit to cost ratio that's greater than one. And so greater than one means it's a greater benefit. Um, and so that's something that utilities consider when they're looking at whether or not to continue doing certain programs. Are, are these programs performing? Are they giving people uh, more savings? You know? Are they giving the utility more savings so that they can pass on to the rate payers? Um, some notes on performance. So uh, these are all the investor-owned utilities in Texas in blue. Um, CPS and Austin Energy are municipally owned utilities, so they're regulated very differently than the investor owned utilities in Texas. CPS and Austin Energy as municipally owned utilities um, are vertically integrated, so they do all of the generation, transmission, distribution um, of energy, and all of these investor owned utilities are deregulated. They have separate, separate functions for generation and separate businesses uh, for generation, transmission, and distribution. Um, and then these two orange utilities here, Oklahoma utilities, I just I have those because they're part of our region. Um, and so you can see CPS Energy is doing just under 0.6% per year, and this is based on the 2016 um, energy savings data. And so that's uh, energy savings in megawatt hours as a percentage of the residential and commercial megawatt hours sold. Um, and so there's a, a national organization called uh, the American Council for an Energy Efficient Economy, and they do a utility scorecard every year. Um, City of San Antonio ranked in the bottom ten. Um, a lot of the a lot of the utilities that you see in the top ten are in the Northeast. Uh, some are in California. You know, there's Colorado, Minnesota. Um, one of the reasons why it can be difficult for uh, utilities in the southeast and in Texas to do a higher percentage of energy efficiency is because of cost effectiveness. So our price of energy is really low in Texas and, uh, and that gets wrapped into these, whole, these calculations that the utilities do for cost effectiveness. And so when your energy costs are really low, then you have to have really inexpensive energy efficiency measures to match that. And so, uh, so we, we kind of tend to end up towards the bottom of the list. Uh, these are the scoring categories from that ACEEE report. Um, energy efficiency program performance, program diversity in emerging areas, and energy efficiency related regulatory issues. And some of the emerging areas are EV charging rates, green button programs where you can uh, you know, give your utility your data from your phone, uh, upstream programs, learning thermostats, there's all kinds of stuff that's going on. Um, okay, and so I did want to get into the equity considerations. Um, I have some older data uh, on energy burden by race, race and ethnicity of householder that I thought y'all would want to look at. Um, so energy burden is the total home energy expenditures divided by your gross household income. Uh, and this data came from the U.S. Energy Information Administration. Uh, they did a, a residential energy consumption survey in 2009. I know they did another one uh, within the past couple of years, but it didn't have uh, the same breakdown by states and uh, race and ethnicity. 
so we weren't able to get more updated data. But uh, the person who put this together for me was from the National Consumer Law Center, and he uh, he did note that these these differences that you see here between uh, between races and ethnicities are statistically significant, and so uh, so this is you know something that. It's concerning to see that if you're you're not white, you're more likely to have a higher energy burden in your home. Yeah, yeah, that's true. And so, energy burden in Texas compared to other states, we're kind of in the middle. Um, electricity rates in Texas low compared to other states, but our bills are higher compared to many states. And so uh, there are different reasons for this. Homes in Texas tend to be larger. Um, we tend to use a lot more air conditioning because it's hot. So just some things to think about. Um, and there was another study done by a group called Energy Efficiency for All, where they took the 51, or yeah, I think 51 largest cities, metropolitan areas in the US, and they um, looked at energy burden. So the median energy burden of low-income households in Dallas, Austin, and San Antonio exceeds the median energy burden of low-income households across all major metropolitan areas. And so San Antonio is right here. This is the metro area median, and then the state average is right down there. So above average energy burdens in San Antonio. Um, and this is in the 2018 quarterly report that CPS gives on the STEP program, and this is available online. Uh, and they're required to produce these maps every quarter. They're also required to put them in the annual reports, but I, I couldn't find the maps in the annual reports. I'm not sure why. But uh, this is essentially like where the rebates are, are going to in the city. Um, and the darker the color in those shaded areas, the, the higher the median income in those locations. And so I think that's by census tract. So it appears that um, more of the more of the rebates are being, you know, kind of they're kind of going towards those higher income areas, but there's also some lower kind of inner city areas, lower income areas that are also getting the rebates. So it's kind of hard to tell with the way the map is oriented. It would probably be easier to have a chart. Um, but uh, this is my last slide, and I would love to have a discussion with y'all about kind of where your your values are in terms of. Uh, where these, this kind of energy efficiency funding for the STEP program should go, would you rather pay 100% of the energy efficiency retrofits for low-income customers and have a high energy burden um, and potentially reduce fewer greenhouse gas emissions, or would you rather pay a much lower percentage of the total cost of retrofits and get a higher greenhouse gas emission reduction? There could be social costs and benefits of either, and I would really love to hear what y'all think. I think I need a concrete example for what pays the ten percent. So let's say I make a uh, hundred thousand dollars a year, and uh, I can afford to put solar panels on my home, uh, except for I, I just need a thousand dollars more to be able to put solar panels on my home. Um, and uh, the utility has a rebate where they're willing to give me two thousand dollars to put solar panels on my home. So it, that that would make economic sense for me to go to the utility and say like, hey, give me this rebate. I'll put solar panels on my home. That's great. Um, as opposed to if I make twelve thousand dollars a year, there's no way in heck that I'm going to put solar panels on my home, and I probably don't even own a home. Um, and so. I would need the utility to pay 100% of the cost as opposed to just, you know, a rebate. So it's a typical, typical hypothetical because, I mean, I don't know what it would cost. If you're saying the expenditures would be the same in both hypotheticals, that's one thing. But again, pay the utilities' for, expenditures would be the same. So right. we're being asked as ratepayers which would we prefer to see the, the utility do? So how about community solar? A bunch of apartment dwellers band together and say, hey, we can get one solar panel for our apartment building. That's not on our apartment building. That's not one of her hypotheticals. Oh. I, I, no, I appreciate what you're oh. saying. I'm just not real sure. Well, well, yeah, I mean, let's talk about that. So what would that look like? If 
if I lived in an apartment and I wanted to band together to buy one solar panel with my neighbors, um, and maybe the maybe the utility is going to pay for part of the rebate, right? Um, you know, then then the utility can spend more money on other on other facilities and buildings, but but then like you know, is that really going to reduce bills that much for for the people in multifamily? It will reduce the emissions, though, won't it? It will, yeah. And isn't that, I mean, we must reduce the emissions. Okay. And that's why the so question is loaded. Yeah. I saw outside yeah. of this inner circle, Budion and Terry have hands up. Okay. So, you, so you're suggesting that these options are cost neutral, right? So it would cost about the same. Well, I'm suggesting that the utility has a pot of money. Let's just say they have. $11 million to spend on energy efficiency. And the question is, how should they distribute their funds? Should they put it all into um, income <coughs> energy efficiency where they pay 100% of the cost um, and get a lower amount of greenhouse gas emission reductions? Or should they uh, only pay partial amounts throughout the community, affect a lot more homes, and get greater greenhouse gas emission reductions? Yes. But not necessarily affect the low income right. customers. Right. Especially. So the, the pot of money would be sufficient to cover the cost of either of these two yeah. proposals. Right. Right. Yeah. Okay. So and the yeah. and the impact would be comparable as well. No. Well, it, it's a I guess it's a trade off between greenhouse gas emission reductions and uh, the kinds of, in, of customers that you're going to impact. Right. So so if it's cost neutral, I would say that the, the impact, the relative impact, would. The next most obvious thing to consider, but just from a strict equity standpoint, it makes no sense to give money to people who can probably already retrofit their own homes. And that's the point of the hypothetical. It's giving you those choices, but those disbenefits as well. And so, so let's go a little deeper. So, how would you optimize this equation in terms of like, wait, are you saying you would totally give 100%? to the low-income customers? Yes. Okay. Does that have to be one or the other? Yeah. It doesn't. It doesn't have to be one or the other. I was kind of giving you some like extremes. So we're getting statistically it's low-income households need less energy than yeah. people of higher income. Exactly, because they're trying to conserve and save money on their bills, right? And um, that's why I was asking about the relative impact, right? So uh, either it, of these proposals, would they have the relative same relative on energy, on energy reductions, or yeah. So I don't, I don't think so. And that's uh, that's one of the considerations. Is kind of like, okay, how many megawatt hours are you going to reduce? How many greenhouse gas emissions are you going to reduce? But I, I do think it comes down to what y'all as a community value here in San Antonio. Or would you like for the utility to to be spending money on people who can already pay most of the cost of the retrofits, or would you like for them to devote a greater portion of money? to people who can't pay any of the retrofit costs. But again, with the greater greenhouse gas reductions, when you pay the rich, that was the hook on the hypothetical. You can pay less money to the poor and have greater greenhouse gas reductions, no question. Yeah. You know, but if it's lower greenhouse gas reductions, then do you weight it the same way? Right. In the climate plan. That's right. a great question. We've got to move to the type of way. You mean there's no answer? Sorry, we're, sorry, we're, well, we've right. we eased <laughs> our time a little bit. We've got just about 21 minutes by the clock, but we can go, I'm comfortable going over. Oh, I'll, I'll try to go through this. Can we turn the lights yeah. off so we can see? Um, yeah, well, maybe we'll Wait. we'll go through kind of what there is, and then hopefully we can have some additional Any discussion. Stuff? Would you introduce yourself? Yeah, um, so for those watching online, my name is Kaiba White. I work at Public Citizen, and uh, I'm deep in debt solar kind of stuff so that's what I'm going to be focusing on here today and really wanted to do uh, two main things one is uh, kind of bring everybody up to speed on what CPS energy is already doing or has done on solar um, and really when I say solar I mean um, their local solar programs their their programs that customers can actively participate in uh, CPS energy has also developed utility scale solar that feeds into the energy that all of its customers are getting, but wanted to focus on that kind of customer side of things and how solar 
um, is playing a role there. And then the second thing is hopefully have a little bit of uh, time to talk about how those programs could be expanded or improved um, with especially a focus, I think, on expanding access to more people here that haven't traditionally been able to benefit. And you know, we just saw that map. Um, and there's a similar sort of uh, story, maybe even a little bit more um, stark, I guess, when it comes to solar. You know, when solar was expensive, well, who could afford to do it? Richer people that, of course, owned their own homes. And that has started to change as costs come down, but uh, there's still progress to be made. So let's get to it. Um, just wanted to kind of give some basics uh, for those who kind of aren't already into the whole solar thing. There's two kind of main working components of a residential or commercial rooftop solar system, and that is your photovoltaic panels, which of course are what are actually producing the energy, but then you need what's called an inverter to convert that energy from direct current, which is what you have on high voltage power lines, to alternating current, which is what we use uh, in our homes. So um, there are two main types of inverters, and I'm going to talk about that, but I'm just going to switch over to kind of show a little graphic of how this works. You have your solar panels on your, on your roof, and this graphic here is showing what's called a string inverter. It's called a string inverter because essentially the solar panels are all wired together in a string and then are connected to this. The, the red box there is, is the inverter. So the inverter is changing that energy into what is compatible with your home and, and what is on the electric grid at the local level. And then that energy, if you are using energy in your home, first it goes to wherever the nearest uh, place in need of energy is, so that will be into your house. Um, and then any excess is going to flow back onto the grid and be used by the next closest energy demand. And so that's probably going to be your neighbors, but wherever the next closest energy demand is where that's going, it's out onto the grid. So the, the main difference is with uh, string inverters, you generally have maybe for a residential system, normally one inverter, if you have a very large system, you might have two going to be on the side of the house usually. They are a bit cheaper, um, but the downside is that if there's any shading or issues with any one panel, all of the panels are going to be, basically their production is limited to that lowest common denominator. So if you have solar panels facing different directions or some that might get shaded during the day, they're not a real great option. And so that's where the micro inverters and kind of modification, which is a DC optimizer. I'm not going to get into the technology here, but essentially these are options where each panel has its own inverter. So it's it's on its own and you can have half of your solar array shaded and the other in the sun and those sunny panels are still producing all the energy that they can. So uh, the cost have really come down on the microinverters and so now they are definitely the more popular option um, because they all kind of offer more flexibility for a wider array of customers, but you do still see string inverters. So just, that's kind of your basic technology. Um, I'll, I'll move on from that. Um, on the financial uh, side of things, I'll get into the local incentives, but there are incentives at the federal and the state level. Uh, at the federal level, it's in the form of a tax credit and of course, this means that you have to owe taxes in order to benefit. And by owe taxes, I mean having paid taxes throughout the year. Um, so there is obviously a whole segment of people who can't benefit from the tax credit, unfortunately. Um, what? On the concept of tax credit. Yes. Yes. So essentially, it, it is. There are two types of tax credits. So the one reduces the amount of tax that you owe. And that is what this is. There's another type of tax credit called a refundable tax credit, whereas even if you didn't owe money, you would still get a check from the IRS. This is not that kind of credit. So unless you have been working and essentially owe taxes, you cannot benefit from this. But you also, even if you do work and you're below a certain That's right. level of income, then you wouldn't owe taxes. 
taxes. Will it catch you in a second or a third year, or is it that one year and then you're out of luck? Um, you you can roll it over. I think it's um, three. It's up to three years. I think it could be. Maybe it's. I want to. See. It's either three or five years. So you can, if you can only use part of your tax credit in year one, you can roll it over. Um, but of course, if you're like retired and on a very low income, then that doesn't help you. But this has definitely been a major driver of solar adoption around the country, and it, it definitely is an important tool for those who, who have enough income to benefit. Um, and then at the state level, the state of Texas doesn't do too much for us, but they do uh, say that if you have on-site renewable energy generation, then that's normally gonna be solar, that you don't have to pay property tax on that as long as you file this one page form. Um, so In other words, the value, of the increased value of your property, you don't pay extra tax on that increase. That's right, that's right. So your property value might go up, but as long as you filed this form, um, and the law did change, I think, last session, the session before, so you only have to file the form once, uh, you don't have to like, file it every year. So you file it once, and then um, that amount should not be taxed. So this is probably the program, the rebate program. Raise your hand if you have heard of CPS Energy's solar rebate program. Okay. Does anybody know about any other programs at CPS that help people with solar? Is there a group? What's the dollar for it? Rootless. Yeah. All right. We got one. You, you um, heard of one? They have had um, community solar. That's what they call roofless solar. Oh, okay. Here. Roofless solar. Yep. But there's Same also thing. the thing of where you can let your roof be used and you don't actually get yeah. to use the solar, Got but it. they pay you. That's right. Yeah. Okay, so the, there are three programs we're going to talk about here. This is uh, CPS Energy's most established program. Um, and, you know, they really have been a leader on supporting rooftop solar uh, most utilities in Texas. Um, and they are still offering a rebate. And as you can see, and the rebate does apply to both residential and commercial installations. Uh, as you can see, there are a couple adders for using local um, solar panels as well as local inverters. And you know, just like energy efficiency drives the creation of local green jobs, so does solar. And this is CPS Energy really trying to um, and maximize that aspect of job creation. Of course, even if the solar panels or the inverters come from elsewhere, you're still creating most of the jobs involved locally because installation is, is the biggest uh, driver of job creation. And you, you can't sort of outsource that because you need, you need somebody local. Now, I say you can't outsource that. You do sometimes get companies kind of flying in and participating in a program and then they're up and gone. And so uh, CPS does try to discourage customers from doing business with those companies and they do that in the form of docking the rebate amount by 25%. So um, I think that this is a, a pretty um, well-designed program in, in terms of trying to both encourage uh, solar adoption and also capture those local jobs. And they just allocated another $15 million, which, you know, if it's about a million dollars a month, should uh, take us well into 2019. And hopefully they will keep making those allocations, but they do seem to put out a bucket of money and then it gets spent and they put out another bucket of money. So I think it's up to everybody who's interested in these programs continuing to encourage that to happen. Um, and so the other, like, really key financial aspect to having solar on your home or at your business is a, a policy called net metering. And the state of Texas does not, is one of the few states that does not have a mandatory net metering policy. So it's up to each utility to either offer net metering or not. And I'm gonna just uh, pop forward um, for a minute here to take a look at kind of what does net metering mean? It's essentially a way of getting credit for the energy that you as a solar customer are producing but not using and pushing back onto the grid. So 
you see some, some lines here and you have coming from your solar array, you have that C line and that's coming into your electrical panel or through your PV meter. Some of it's going into your electrical panel and therefore into your home and being used. And that's what's called self-consumption. What comes through your PV meter, but then, well, your house just doesn't need it all because maybe you're gone or you have an efficient home and you're not using a lot, is coming back out into the grid. And it, as you can see, it's coming through your PV meter, through your billing meter, and CPS Energy is taking what's coming in for, through your billing meter from the grid and subtracting what you're pushing out, and essentially that is what you're billed on. So it is the net. Yeah. So simple in concept, which is, I think, good for the customer. And it also makes it so the customer is getting full retail value for all of that energy that they're producing. Now, there is an exception to the full retail value. Uh, at CPS, they do what's called monthly net metering. So each month is, is really treated as its own uh, kind of bucket of energy consumption and production. And if you overproduce in a month, so if you actually produce more energy than, um, than you use overall, what CPS does <coughs> is converts that into a dollar amount. And this is what they use. So your, your kilowatt hours will be multiplied by six point, or 1.65 cents. If you ever look at your electric bill, you know that this is much, 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 much lower than your retail rate. Uh, so, yeah. well, let me ask you a question. Um, I think a lot of people get confused with net metering because they think that they could have the ability to actually be paid money from the utility, but that's not true, right? They just get a credit with the utility? With, with CPS Energy, you're only gonna get a credit. Yeah. Um, so you'll get you know whatever the small credit is and it will roll over onto your next month's bill. Uh, there are some utilities that do pay out checks. Yeah, but not in Texas, right? Uh, yeah, like actually, I, I think um, like Central Texas Electric Co-op, I think, oh, okay. so actually maybe cuts checks. Are allowed to do it with the IOUs and the unions. And you know, I don't think it's that anybody isn't allowed to do it. They're just, most of them are pretty hesitant to do that. In fact, PEC might also cut checks too. I'm not 100% sure. And I think Blue Bonnet might at the end of the year as well. Another question. I don't know what the program is now, but uh, in 2013, when I had solar panels put on, on my house, there was, to get the rebate, there was a restricted amount that, of kilowatt, a, a, a particular size was as, as much as you could put on a roof. And it's carefully calculated so that they rarely, if ever, pay you anything. And since November of 13, but we've had two months where we um, were, were paid, and I think the maximum was five cents one month, and it was two cents another month. So you're rich now. Yeah. Yes, I got it. But I've also never had a bill over $63. That's good. Yeah, I, I think Well, I, I also paid after all the rebates, $20,000 for the system, so. That's okay. All right, so yeah, does, does, is there anybody who maybe still has any questions on how net metering works? Are we pretty good on this? Okay, cool. So, you know, like I said, this is the program that has really been around and, and most of the customer side solar is, is under this program. The main benefit is you're capturing full value as long as you're, of course, not overproducing. If you're overproducing, then you're definitely not capturing full value. Um, and so you really want to size your system to meet kind of a, an average middle month. Um, you don't want to have too many months where you're overproducing or else you're just giving away, giving away energy to your neighbors, which, you know, is nice, but not great financially. But there are obviously some drawbacks to this program when it comes to access. So, you know, you're gonna need either cash on hand or you're gonna need good credit to get financing. Um, and CPS does uh, limit this program to owned systems. So if you've heard of solar leasing, 
that is not going to get you the rebate at CPS, um, and really you, you still have credit issues even for leases. So, you know, you either need good credit or you're going to need cash. Um, you know, obviously, you're going to need appropriate roof space. So that's roofs that are not shaded, that are hopefully facing either south or west or southwest. Um, a little bit towards the east can be fine, but probably not full east and definitely not north. Um, and then, of course, like we talked about, to get the tax credit, you, you're going to need tax liability. You need that. You know, you need to owe some taxes. So I think these kind of cons here are why CPS has really started um, branching out into other program designs. Other program designs. Yep, including ruthless so. Oh. It just it'll come out. It's just I guess it's less energy when the projector doesn't work. Uh, I think just give it a minute. Describe to us. <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll move forward because that was a photo. So oh, oh, okay. maybe it just wanted to be activated. Okay, so this is a, a photo of. The 1.2 megawatt uh, community solar or roofless solar installation, and this is uh, is uh, CPS's first uh, community solar uh, installation. But I, I know it's not going to be their last, and we'll kind of talk about that a little. As you can see, this is very different. It's you know out in a, a large area that can. Uh, so it's really the, the financing that is the difference between this and Blue Wing down south. So that's a huge field that CPS Energy has installed as a generation plan. Yeah, the, it really, if you go and look at them, it, you know, other than maybe the, the size, you know, 1.2 megawatts isn't huge. Um, it's obviously huge compared to a rooftop system. But yeah, it's, it's essentially a, you know, commercial size solar installation, a utility scale solar installation. The difference is, yeah, the, the participation from the customer. So community solar comes in all different kind of guises, and uh, what we're talking about here is a utility-run program. In other places, there are more different models, and some of them are, you know, more kind of community-driven community solar. Um, but this is definitely a valid mo model, and it, you know, just is run by the utility. So uh, Clean Energy Collective is maintaining the system. They run the program. So when you sign up, it's through Clean Energy Collective. But they are um, they are doing this on behalf of CPS Energy. So um, panels are actually bought by the customer, and they are sold out now. But um, essentially, they initially cost about four hundred dollars each. CPS applied a rebate to that amount, and then course anybody with tax liability was able to take the tax credit because you purchased the solar panel and then customers receive a credit on their bill and this is a fixed amount so unlike the net metering it's not tied to the retail rate it's just this fixed 14 cents per kilowatt hour and that will extend for 25 years so you know on the front end exactly how much you're gonna get and that 14 cents is actually a bit more than the retail rate so this is a pretty favorable program designs. It's obviously subsidized. Um, I don't know if we'll, we should expect the next round to look exactly like this in all those ways. You know, the rebate applied and this 14 cents. But they are we'll considering. See. They are reconsidering the program. Yes, um, but all of this is great because it means that the projected payback is nine years, and that's you know, a pretty certain kind of calculation because you know exactly how much you're going to be paid. And customer credit paid on the production. What That's if right. your What if your panel fails? So that comes under the Clean Energy Collective maintenance. So it's their job to maintain the system. The customer is not responsible. For that. So they know about the production of the panel that it will produce for 25 years at that rate. They're warranted. For 25 years, yeah, pretty much. I, I don't know of any solar panels that are not warranted for 25 years. Warranty that's insured 
Essentially. By the company. Tornadoes coming through, take them all out. What's that happen? So just put them back up again? Yeah. Okay. Um, so th there are, I think, I mean, to this program, it's, it's pretty attractive. And that's, of course, why it's sold out. Uh, you know, you have a large system with, I think it's single axis tracking, so you're going to get better production than on a rooftop system. You don't need to own your own home, you don't need to have a rooftop that's not shaded, all of that. Um, you still need the cash though. Um, and I, and I, this is just, I'm sorry, I was copying stuff in, the financing I don't think is an option in this case. Maybe there was a way to do that, but you, you need money up front to be able to purchase. Same thing with the tax liability, tax credit. And then we recently uh, found out that there is a little snafu. Bear County is uh, trying to charge all the participants property tax on these panels that they've purchased. But yeah, so that's, that's pretty unfortunate. And I know that CPS uh, is trying to work on that. You have a question about oh, that? Some of us have our taxes frozen because we're little people. So they're going to try to put money onto that, even though the program. So this is separate from your home, right? Oh. And that's why it's not oh. exempt okay. under state law, or why oh. the county is reading the state law that way. Um, I, you yeah. know, hopefully they come around and, and decide that this is exempt. Um, but right now, that's that's how it's working. As they're saying. You own part of this commercial physical asset on this property, and well, you could kind of through the okay, presentation, okay. and then. So I'm going to move on to uh, what I think is one of the most innovative things CPS uh, has done on the solar front, or really with their programming at all. And that's the Solar Host program. Um, this really was, I think, uh, you know, great great concept to try to open up access to solar. And um, I say that because it doesn't require any investment on the part of the customer. So the, the, the way it works is there is a solar contractor, a solar company, they have a, what's called a power purchase agreement with the utility and they go out and find a bunch of rooftops, install solar, they're selling that energy to CPS and that company is maintaining the solar panels, similar to how we have the roofless solar or any power purchase agreement. The private company maintains, operates, deals with all of that. CPS gets the energy. And then CPS is providing a credit on customers' bills. And it's three cents per kilowatt. So it's obviously much less than for those customers who are either purchasing their own rooftop system or purchasing a piece of the roofless solar, but that is because they are not putting any of their own money in. Um, so that's kind of how you can make the, the finances work on that. Um, you do have qualifications for per participating. Um, there's not an income qualification, so any, anybody of any income can apply, but you do have to have an appropriate roof, and the roof needs to be in good condition, as well as not shaded or facing the wrong direction. Um, and, and there's some other things that you can kind of see down here in the cons are reasons why people get, get rejected. Um, but this concept is obviously very popular. They had about 6,000 customers initially apply to this program. Um, this one is also now closed. It was a five megawatt pilot. Um, that's the good news. The, the bad news is that, you know, a lot of people did get rejected. Um, there were some who didn't, you know, get solar through the program simply because they didn't, they kind of looked out, right? But there was also a lot of homes that, you know, had shading or were kind of, oriented in a way that, that wasn't compatible with solar. And those things are just understandable. Not every home is going to be right for solar. But then there were some things that really, I think, highlight the challenges for getting solar on low-income homes. And that was that there were issues with roof age and condition, and then older homes that need an electric panel upgrade because you have to have a way to feed that energy into your electric panel. and 
has spots left on your panel, then you need a new one, and that can be, you know, $1,500, $2,000. Um, but do you have a question on that? I yeah, he says no. Okay. <laughs> and we will keep going. <laughs> but this, so there are challenges here. This was a pilot, and I think that's, that's a key thing to remember is this was supposed to be a learning experience as well as, you know, hopefully a way to get more people solar. Um, so these are some things that we learned that this rejection rate was, was very high, especially at first, they did loosen up the um, requirements and it got better. Obviously the customer receives less value, but I kind of talked about that. So, you know, this is just illustrating that it is another form of distributed solar on rooftops, and it is open to commercial customers as well. So I, I did a little bit of uh, thinking about ways that, you know, what is a good suite of programs could be improved. Um, we talked about net metering and how right now it's on a month by month basis. Uh, not a, That's not necessarily the case everywhere. Um, some utilities just continue rolling those kilowatt hours over as opposed to rolling, converting them to dollars and then rolling them onto the next bill, they're obviously much more valuable as kilowatt hours because the kilowatt hour offsets the, at the retail rate. So that's you know something that CPS could change. Um, the other is creating something called virtual net metering, and this would make it feasible basically to use solar to um, offset energy use in apartments and condos, any sort of multifamily situation. Right now, there's no way to divide uh, output from one solar array to multiple um, homes. And, and by homes, I am talking about multifamily. So this would still be on-site solar, but it's kind of a way of doing on-site community solar. So just another, another possible kind of billing system change. Um, I think still with the affordability issue, um, adding like a rebate amount specifically for affordable housing. And I'm thinking here, you know, not necessarily trying to um, do that for all single family low income households, but more focused on the, that multifamily housing that um, is used by low income people. Um, I'm not gonna get into this because we're kind of short on time, but on bill repayment is something that is being used other places and it's, similar in concept to PACE, except for being, instead of being tied to your property tax, it's tied to your electric meter. And then kind of on their uh, existing uh, programs, and I think this is where we really have an opportunity as a group, is to weigh in on these things because they are in motion right now. Um, CPS is currently evaluating proposals for up to five megawatts of community solar, so that roofless solar program, they're looking to add to it, that's great. Um, they haven't made any decisions, but I think they're they're hoping to do that real soon. Um, you know, sometime hopefully in the, the next month or by the end of June at least. Um, I hope that what comes out of that is that there is what's called a subscription model added to what they already have, and that would basically do away with that barrier of having to have cash up front to purchase the panels in the community solar array. Instead, you can do a subscription so you pay on your monthly bill and are credited on your monthly bill. So um, it really makes it much more accessible to people without cash on hand. Likewise, the solar host program, I guess they haven't put out another RFP for that yet. They're still doing evaluation um, and I think that this is a place where we can especially be useful. Um, we know what some of the main barriers are, especially for people who are low income and maybe you know, don't have their roofs as well maintained as others might. Um, and we know that you know, 6,000 people tried to participate in this program, so there's demand out there. I would hope that we can kind of you know, throw our weight behind making that program better, trying to link that program up with some home repair funding to, you know, make those rooftops, uh, you know, appropriate for solar and, you know, and hopefully focus that money on the, on the people that really need it. 
um, you know, have that be an income qualified kind of thing. So these are some of my ideas. Um, sorry that we're not going to have a ton of time to discuss, but I hope hope we can going forward. Well, we're at the end of our at four o'clock. We're pushing it over, right? But yeah, I mean, but I think if folks want to stay and have some conversation, uh, discussion, I've got fifteen percent battery life. Okay. <laughs> you had a question, Peter. Yeah, I had several. Uh, All right. Looking at the concept of what would probably be most effective for a lot of the communities that the Conduct Action Essay represents, I just would very much appreciate continuing the, the discussion on perhaps trying to find pots of money for roof repair or structural repair, but in addition, given that we can if we thought about what the physical difficulties are in the older homes, and I will again separate them into at least structural, where your your frame is poor, your frame is broken on your house, so it can't bear the weight, versus, or as a second, your shingles are bad, or whatever the actual roof is you have now is bad. And I'm just thinking in terms of the solar panels that they have now, which are the roof. So in the case that you were looking at roofs that the shingles were bad and they wanted solar panels, well, perhaps there could be some way to finance installation of a roof that was the roof material itself and was a solar uh, generator, the solar panels itself. They make those as one unit as opposed to having a fixed shingle roof that you put a structure on top of that with your solar panels. So if, if, <coughs> if there were systems like that that we could look at and promote if they make economic sense, that's the kicker right there. Right now, that is a much more expensive option okay. than traditional PV panels. Yeah. Or, or so, right. Okay. So maybe we'll get there. I, I, I like the idea of an all-in-one kind of product, um, but we're... Or something that can solve maybe not every problem, but some problem. Yeah, I think maybe eventually. I don't I don't think that that's our, you know, our near-term solution if we're trying to uh, have things that so do you, do you, I would be interested to see what kind of cost differential there were yeah. and also to kind of track that because that, again, you know, predictably it will go down. It will. Cost. It will. And so I, I don't think that it's, you know, a bad idea. I think it's, it's definitely something that will become more popular for that reason. When you need to place your roof anyway, go ahead and make it a solar roof. Wonderful idea. And, uh, I think that's a good model and way to be thinking about it. There's a group called Green Healthy Homes Initiative that, um, is looking at ways to leverage funding for replacing lead pipes in homes, for example, and kind of doing like full home retrofits. So they're including energy efficiency measures in with these retrofits oh, for, for other, you know, public health issues that have arisen in certain. And is that on residential? Yeah. Oh. Yeah. And so there could be ways to kind of like combine projects. Yeah, to, absolutely. You know, That's kind of more holistic. It's in. It, I would love to see the breakdown on those because again, the yeah. concept of going into the retrofit of an, an entire existing stick train home, that's... I mean, you know, it doesn't have to be everything, but let's just say like, well, how you know, if you're already, already going to like tear open the walls to replace some lead pipes, you might as well fix the insulation. Right, <laughs> so, right, right. Yeah. You know, uh, Maybe, yeah. Uh, one of the things that I was uh, recalling was about four or five years ago, Sierra Club had a, an article in their monthly magazine about microgrids. And there were a lot of features about the microgrids that would be, I think, very sensible for a place like San Antonio with the idea that if there is a failure at the state grid level, that basically we could disconnect and take care of our own grids at the block level or what have you so that my uh, battery powered car could could save energy uh, share it with uh, the next door neighbor who has needs an oxygen uh, um, thing, uh, machine on and, and the, those kinds of things um, what, what are we doing? Our tight end is resilience. Good thing. So, wait, I just want to respond to the micro grid thing. Uh, He's running out of battery, so can okay. we? Well, I mean, we've got time to talk afterwards, but right. I think we've had a good presentation. Yeah. I want to thank you guys for coming. <laughs>
We look forward to, yeah, we could, um, hold, can you hold on, we're, we're, and, okay. we're, and we gotta get out of here for the next oh, group to come in, oh, no. but there's time to talk, I mean, we're free, okay. but if you give me just a minute, Alice, to sure. shut down here, not confuse everybody. <laughs> oh, that's okay.